Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for Sunday, August 2nd, 2020. I hope everyone got a chance to uh, head outside yesterday and enjoy the beautiful temperatures, uh, which were slightly unusual for a uh, August, an early August Saturday. Um, I invite everyone to download the bulletin that can be found in, at the link in the description below this video, or you can find it at our website, www.centralprespb.com. Click on the publications link and scroll down to see today's date and you'll be able to download it. It has been reformatted in the last couple of weeks to make it much easier to print and uh, handle at home uh, during these uh, uh, online virtual worship services. Um, now I ask everyone to turn their attention to the announcements found on the back of that bulletin. Uh, the archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and YouTube. Links to each are on our website, as I mentioned before, www.centralprespb.com. Also on our website, online giving is now available. On the top uh, right-hand corner, you'll see a Donate Now link. If you click that, uh, you'll be able to use debit card, credit card, excuse me, credit card, debit cards, and checks. You can also set up recurring donations on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. And also another announcement that wasn't, uh, didn't get a chance to get in the bulletin, uh, the session will hold their monthly, um, their first of actually what should have been monthly uh, session meetings uh, this afternoon at 1.30 following today's worship service. Uh, we uh, all uh, session members are uh, expected and invited to attend. Um, let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Thanks, to be, thanks be to you, O God, that we have risen this day to the rising of this life itself. Be the purpose of God between us and each purpose, the hand of God between us and each hand, the pain of Christ between us and each pain, the love of Christ between us and each love, beloved of the, of the waifs, beloved of the naked, Draw us to the shelter house of the Savior of the poor. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Let us, let us ask God to forgive us, first in unison using the prayer printed in the bulletin, and then silently. Gracious God, we confess that we are those disciples, expecting people to fend for themselves and afraid to take responsibility for others. We forget the blessings we have received at others' hands and resist the common life to which you call us. O oh God, forgive us for, for hearing only what we want to hear, for underestimating you, your claim upon us and your power to change us for pursuing goals that serve no greater good, to teach us to follow and obey you, that we may receive your gifts and share them gladly, and so be satisfied with the life you intend for us. And now silently. Amen. As people born of the water and the spirit, we have died to the old life and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Last week, we were able to have a brief um, video from uh, Dominic for our children's sermon. Uh, after the great reception I received uh, about Dominic during the service from several of our members, I took a moment to ask Miss Rose if she wouldn't mind preparing a children's sermon uh, that we can use uh, for this Sunday. Uh, she graciously obliged. So. Uh, now for the young and young at heart, please draw near to the internet viewing device uh, for today's children's sermon with Miss Rose. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. But today I want to tell you about a man named Fred 
who was having sort of a good day and sort of a bad day. So I'm going to let you figure out what kind of day you think he had. Fred decided he wanted to fly an airplane. So he went to the airport and he got on a, on a plane. He got on one of those small planes, you know, one of those twin engine planes that has an engine on each, each side of on the wings. And as he was flying his airplane, unfortunately, one of the engines conked out. But Fred thought, well, that's okay. We still have another, another engine that can fly the plane. But shortly after that, the other engine conked out. So the plane was falling. Well, fortunately, Fred had on a parachute, so he jumped out of the plane. Unfortunately, the parachute wouldn't open. Fortunately, though, Fred was over a body of water, a small lake, and so he was going to land in the water rather than on the hard ground. But after landing in the water, unfortunately, Fred didn't know how to swim. But fortunately, there was a man in a boat that came along and Fred got in his boat. Unfortunately, the boat sprang a leak and started to sink. But fortunately, the man in the boat could swim. So he helped Fred and himself to shore. That's a lot of good things and bad things that happened to Fred on his trip trying to fly a plane. But you know what? There is something that is always good. And you know what that is? God. God is always good. God doesn't matter if we're having a bad day or a good day. God's love is always there for us. So remember the next time you're having a good day or a bad day, or maybe a little of both, that God is always good and will be there for you. Let us say a prayer. Dear God, Thank you for always being there with us in the good times and in the bad times. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Miss Rose, for that great uh, children's sermon. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, she'll be able to uh, continue to make videos for us each week as we continue these online services. Um, uh, with the children's sermon over, it is now to turn our attention over to Reverend Tim Reeves with this week's a sermon, Blessed Brokenness. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad you can join us virtually as we worship God this morning. And as we worship God, let us prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word. Our first reading this morning comes from the 32nd chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning with verse 22 and proceeding through verse 31. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children across the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it the, that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Our second reading this morning <clears throat> comes from the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 13th verse and proceeding through verse 21. 
Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear. That hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you were glorified in heaven. Amen. One of the great things about our Old Testament lesson this morning is the fact that the story is so universal. We are told in this account in Genesis that Jacob wrestled with God. We're not told why. The storyteller displays great acumen in leaving that detail out because by not describing the reason for this wrestling match, the storyteller includes the possibility for our striving with God as well. Time and time again, the history of Israel would reflect that nation's name as, it, as its people repeatedly wrestled with God and with God's covenant. And I would imagine that in our own histories, we too exhibit that same capacity to wrestle with God particularly when God calls us to do something we would rather not do. We're quick to say things, I'm not worthy, or I'm not good enough, or you have the wrong person, God. We chafe under the yoke of expectations that God lays on each one of us. Truthfully, the church, even when it is most effective in its ministry, is always astonished at how much more our Lord intends for us to do. Little wonder, then, that we prefer to do things our own way. And then the wrestling match is on. Much of my own personal striving with God has centered on the fact that at times God has not always lived up to my expectations. I've battled brokenness and pain. I've known humiliation and shame. I've endured long periods of time when God was silent. I've raged against God and against humans in the presence of suffering. And I've wondered why bad things happen to good people. And though the reasons may differ, I would suspect that you too have had similar feelings. We all know what it means to be disappointed or to feel sorrow. We all have known anger and injustice. And we all have at least wondered, I would imagine, at one time or another, just exactly where God is and what God is doing when 
things are not going as we expected or wanted. We probably all asked at one time or another, why God, why? I wish I knew the answer to that question, but I don't. I don't know why evil people do the things that they do. I don't know why a storm or forest fire can destroy one house and leave the house next to it unscathed. I don't know why babies die or why cancer cells grow or why any of our lives could be changed forever in the blink of an eye for any number of reasons. I'd love to know why, but God has not revealed those things to me. But what I have learned during my own times of wrestling with God is far more important. It's enough for any of us to know where God is in the midst of suffering and how the Holy Spirit can sanctify us in our suffering and bless our brokenness. I'm reminded of a parable that illustrates, I think, rather beautifully what I'm trying to say. Billions of people were scattered on a great plain before God. And some of the groups near the front were talking rather heatedly and wondering how God could judge anyone else when God did not know what they had endured. One woman jerked back a sleeve to reveal a tattooed number she had received at a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror and beatings and torture and death, she screamed. In another group, an African-American man lowered his collar. Well, what about this? He demanded, showing an ugly rope burn. He had been lynched for no other reason than simply because he was black. And he went on to say that his people had suffocated on slave ships and been wrenched from loved ones and toiled till death gave release. And far out across the plain were hundreds of such groups and each one had their own complaint against God because of the evil and suffering that they had endured and that God had permitted to happen. Some were even heard to say how lucky God was to live in heaven where there was no weeping and no fear and no hunger and no hatred. Some even said God lives a pretty sheltered life. So it was decided that each group would choose a leader to speak for them and go before the throne of God and present their case. And their case was rather simple. Before God could judge any of them, God must endure what they had endured. So God would be sentenced to live on earth as a man. But because this was God, they had to set certain safeguards to be sure that God could not use God's own divine powers to stack the deck. So they said, let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted so that no one would know who his father really is. Let him champion a cause so just but so radical that it would bring down upon him the hatred and condemnation and efforts of every major traditional and established religious authority to eliminate him. Then they said, let him try to describe what no human has ever seen or tasted or heard or smelled. Let him try to communicate God's love to humanity. Let him be betrayed by his dearest friends. Let him be indicted on false charges and tried before a prejudiced jury and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him see what it is to be terribly alone 
and completely abandoned, abandoned by every living thing. Let him be tortured and then let him die a most humiliating death. And as each one of these group's leaders announced his or her own portion of this sentence, loud murmurs of approval would go up through the great throng of people. But something happened when the last condition had been set and pronounced aloud. Instead of murmurs of approval, there was the sound of sheer silence. No one uttered a single word. No one moved. Because suddenly everyone realized God had already served that sentence. Now, what I think that story reminds us is that God knows intimately our suffering because God in Christ Jesus endured such suffering. When the Word became flesh and lived among us, the God of all creation became as frail and vulnerable as any of us is, subject to the same trials and tribulations which beset us all. In Jesus Christ, God knew joy and sorrow, hope and disappointment, shame and degradation, pain and abandonment. So the answer to the question, where is God when we suffer, is that God is with us suffering right alongside us. In the breaking of Christ's body on the cross, in life and in death, God ministered to a sinful and broken world offering redemption and reconciliation, forgiveness and peace. And in so doing, God exhibited compassion toward creation that words just cannot describe, which I think leads us to our New Testament lesson and how it intersects our lives these days. Jesus looks at the crowd of people, and Matthew tells us he has compassion. He knows their lot in life is hard. He knows how it is marked by drudgery and disappointment. He recognizes their physical hunger and their spiritual and emotional needs that so often go unmet. In healing those with diseases, he demonstrates not only his ability, but also his willingness to heal humanity. And for starving souls a long way from their heavenly home, he offers himself as the bread of life, the true manna from heaven. Everything about this passage in Matthew indicates that more is at stake than a mere picnic by the sea. What's at stake is the meeting of our most basic human needs. Yes, our need for food is a basic need, but so too is the recognition and knowledge that we have been redeemed from the bondage of sin and reconciled to God and one another. And so too is it to be comforted in our affliction and lifted up when the slings and arrows of this life beat us down. Now, if we recognize similarities in the way that Matthew tells the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and the way he tells the story of the Last Supper, we should not be surprised because the intent in both of these stories is the same. Just as the bread is broken in both of those stories, so was Christ's body broken for us all. And in giving his life for the life of the world, Jesus hallowed all life and brought us all into the presence of God. We are redeemed from our sin. And equally important for the one who endures suffering in this life is the blessed assurance that we are not alone. 
because the one who endured everything for our sake still stands with us in our suffering. And because he himself has walked through the valley of the shadow of death, we can find solace when he takes us by the hand and says, come with me. I know the way through. Such assurance may seem to be of little of importance or even little comfort to anyone who expects life to be rosy and sweet. But to anyone who has ever known the dark night of the soul, there is inestimable value in the recognition that we are not alone in those times of trials and tribulations. Like those people in the parable I shared earlier, we soon realize that God can and does identify with us in our suffering because of the suffering that God in Christ endured. So the answer to the question, where were you when such things happened, is I was with you in the same scrape. But what about the second question? How can the Holy Spirit sanctify our suffering and bless our brokenness? Well, I think the answer can again be found in the feeding of the 5,000. I think our natural tendency is to want to identify with the crowds because initially that is where we are in our suffering. We are the ones in need of compassion. We are the ones whose bodies and souls hunger for the bread of life. We are the ones who have come seeking healing. We come in all our brokenness seeking answers that will give us hope and joy. And miracle of miracles, we find that we are, we find what we are seeking in God's presence. Moreover, in the presence of God, we find our orientation is changed. The lessons we learn about ourselves and our God along the way help change our orientation. In the valleys where we are forced to come to terms with our own shame and degradation and our own individual hells on earth, we are allowing our open wounds to bleed. Bleeding is one of the body's first lines of defense against infection. As the blood flows out of the wound, it sweeps away with it the bacteria that would have invaded the body in the wounding. And as we bleed in our brokenness, we find that God is also sweeping away the infectious invader, invaders of resentment and rage that would keep us from the healing grace of reconciliation. But if we stay in that position, then that will not only kill us physically, but spiritually. After allowing and exposing the wounds to the open to bleed for a while, God then moves us towards healing. After we emerge from the valley, after we have been able to forgive, after we have received mercy upon mercy from God, then we are ready for God to hallow our brokenness. Then we see that we are no longer the ones seeking solace. Instead, we become the means by which our Lord feeds others and heals others who are broken. Remember, this story is intentionally told in a way that echoes the language of the Last Supper. Think about when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. In the great thanksgiving, one of the things we pray is, as this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. In other words, use us, O oh God, in all of our brokenness to satisfy the spiritual hunger of a hurting world. Use our experiences of being wounded to bind up the wounds of others. Use our suffering to ease the burdens of others. Use our shame and degradation to lift up the lives of others. Use our own experiences of pain and torment to comfort others. 
Use our experiences of healing and reconciliation to speak peace to others. As you have blessed us, O oh God, in your brokenness, send us out in our brokenness to be a blessing to others. In other words, we pray, O oh God, sanctify what we have endured, that we might glorify you by serving others who are similarly suffering and hurting. The limited resources of our lives may seem like meager offerings, no greater than five loaves and two fish. But God still takes those meager offerings and transforms them into real abundance in ways none of us could ever imagine. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which this week again will be taken electronically. If you'd like, please visit our website, www.centralprespb.com. Click on the Donate Now link, and, and you can make your tithe that way. If you prefer, you can also mail your tithe in. Uh, our address is 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day when, at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let us share our joys and concerns. Um, I have a couple of uh, prayer requests that we received from our Facebook group. Uh, if you'd like to join our Facebook group, uh, please feel free to go to facebook.com slash centralprespb. Um, like our page, send us a message, and I'll get you joined to that group as soon as I can. Uh, we are at, we've been asked to pray for Adam Vick, who is recovering from successful soldier, shoulder surgery. Excuse me. Um, he has been in some pain since that, uh, that surgery occurred, and it's going to be a very long and arduous recovery. So please keep, keep Adam in your prayers. Uh, we continue to keep uh, Brad Von Tunglin in our prayers. Uh, he is continuing to have medical issues, and we continue to hold him in prayer. Uh, we, as I said at the uh, announcements, the session will be holding their monthly, or what should have been their monthly meeting at the, uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, please keep the session members in your prayers, and, and we uh, pray that they make uh, God's will be done in our, with our congregation and in this church. Uh, we continue to ask for prayer for those who are affected by the coronavirus, um, those who are on the front lines, medical professionals, law enforcement officers, um, retail um, uh, people. Um, we ask that those who, um, we ask you th that you be with those people. We also ask that you be with uh, those who um, have lost loved ones, over 150,000 here in the U.S. Um, to this horrible disease. 
uh, be with those families who have lost lost loved ones. Um, we also continue to ask for, for um, comfort for our uh, nation and our world. Uh, we ask that you pray for, for the, our, our leaders and our um, and our and in the continuation of the striving for peace throughout our world. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. We ask for your healing hands to be placed on Adam Vick and Bradley Von Tunglin. We ask that you give wisdom and, and um, encourage to the session members to make the correct decisions and have your will be done with this congregation and in this community. We ask that you be with those who have lost loved ones to this horrible coronavirus. We ask that you place protections on those who are on the front lines, our uh, first responders, our medical professionals, and our uh, soon to be our teachers um, and our children who are returning to school soon. Uh, we ask that you be with our nation and our world as we go through um, these troubled times. And we ask that you lead our, uh, uh, give the knowledge and the, and the courage to do the right thing to our leaders and those leaders around the world. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace, to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.